We continue our conversation about how the devil attacks from multiple directions. I've given a khutbah previously contemplating only on how he attacks from the front and another of how he attacks from behind. And I only started introducing how he attacks from the right. And it's interesting that Allah Azza wa mentions multiple rights, aymanihim, not yaminihim, but aymanihim, multiple rights. And that is to say that there are multiple, more variety of attacks from the right. And for each person, that actually has means different things. So what I introduced to you last time is the idea of the right being associated with good deeds uh, and with something good. And right is also in many languages, including the English language, the word right, not only for direction, but also for something that's correct or something that you deserve, like this is my right, right? So this is actually not just something that's found in the Arabic language because a yameen is an oath, a yameen is something that you owe, a yameen is part of your dignity, uh, the yameen, the, the right hand is actually associated with righteousness, um, the, the left hand is associated with shady behavior, criminal behavior, that sort of thing. And so, which is why even last time I mentioned how the, on Judgment Day, people that are in favor or in Allah's favor that, did, that lived the correct way are people of the right hand. So now we're learning that shaitan attacks us from the right and multiple kinds of attacks from the right. So we got to think about that a little bit. One, just as a quick recap, one attack that I introduced you to and myself to and reminded myself of is shaitan will make you think of the good things you have done or the good things I have done and make us proud of them. And so the good thing that it, our, our deeds are supposed to make us humble, but he reverse engineers how we're supposed to think about this good deed and we start thinking we've accomplished something. They assume they've accomplished something amazing by having done this good deed. So people become, sometimes people love to mention titles. Like you know in worldly life, there are titles and sometimes people are very proud of what they've accomplished. So they just don't want to say my name is Akram, they want to say my name is Dr. Akram, right? Even though they, you know, they, they love to tell you that. It's, it's different when other people call you that, but you wouldn't yourself love hearing that, that's a problem. Or when somebody says their name and then they say, make sure you say PhD or something. Or you know, they, they, they want to add some title. Well, sometimes even within the Islamic sense, somebody says, hey, Abdullah is here. No, 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 Al-Hajj Abdullah. I just came back from Hajj. You know, it's kind of like I need to know, I need to be recognized for what I've accomplished. So this need to recognize a good deed even, you know, or Hafiz so-and-so, or Sheikh, and somebody calls you, you know, uh, uh, Norman, or somebody calls me Norman, I say, no, 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 Sheikh, I'm not a Sheikh anyway. But you got to add that title in. No, I don't need that title. And that title doesn't add anything, you know, and so the idea of needing recognition and also for yourself to feel like you've accomplished something amazing by doing something good. Our good deeds are supposed to be something that humble us. Our good deeds are supposed to be something we present before Allah and we say to Allah, Ya Allah, this deed that I've done, I pray that you accept it. Because whatever I did, even if I prayed or did hajj or fasted, whatever I did, I know I didn't do it perfectly. I know there were mistakes. I know it could have been done better. So as broken and as imperfect as it is, I'm begging you, Ya Allah, to accept it. Well, that's humility. That's not, that's not something I'm entirely proud of, but it's something that I'm supposed to be humble about. But shaitan wants that element to go away. He wants that to become a matter of pride. From that now, another problem is that when people do good deeds and, and do righteous deeds, or let's just say somebody was a non-Muslim, and Allah guided them to Islam and they accepted Islam. Or some of you that were born in a Muslim family weren't practicing your religion and something clicked in you and you started praying. Or you started changing the way you speak or you started changing the way you, you spend your life or the company you keep. You made changes in your life. Then people look back at that moment and say, Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah guided me. I feel bad for all these people that aren't guided yet. Wait a second, when you say Allah guided me, that means that you already have the guaranteed stamp and these other people don't have it. At that one moment, Allah guided you and made you turn from a, a life of evil towards something better. Yes. But that doesn't mean you own guidance now. It doesn't mean that it's something that you have now and you won't let it go. It's not something that human beings were given the opportunity to possess. Inna al-huda, huda Allah. Guidance is a property of Allah. It belongs to Allah. It doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to you. So the amount that you learn, or the amount that you practice, or the way that your appearance changes, maybe you dress and you, you, know, you look far more religious than you did before. Maybe you speak far more religiously than you did before. Maybe you know a lot more about the religion than you know, knew before. Maybe you even worship a lot more than you worship before. Maybe those things have changed. But that still, none of that means you have more guidance. Guidance is something we have to beg for no matter what state we're in. The, someone who's memorized the Qur'an and recites the whole thing every week and worships has to beg Allah for guidance. 
and someone who's far away from the deen and is just taking half a first step also has to ask Allah for guidance. Nobody has more access to it or less access to it. This is something we're all thirsty for. I like to compare, like Allah does Himself, He compares the guidance of the Qur'an to water, to the rain, or to water itself. Now the thing about water is, you and I can't say, Alhamdulillah, two years ago I had a glass of water ever since I'm good. No, it doesn't work that way. You get thirsty again, your body needs it again, it needs it again. That's why we have to go back and fill that thirst of guidance. Every time we stand in salah, we ask Allah to fill that thirst. اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ But shaitan wants us to think that guidance already happened. Now it's other people's problem. Ours has already been solved. I feel bad for everyone else. And when you start thinking like that, then you know what happens? Your focus is no longer on yourself. Your focus is on everybody else. You know like if you have been fed, and your stomach is full, maybe now you can concern yourself with the other one who's hungry. And you start feeling like, well, I'm already filled with guidance, so now I have to worry about everybody else who doesn't have guidance. Actually, you, we never stop concerning ourselves with ourselves. I'm not saying don't worry about anybody else, but I'm saying always, 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 our first concern is ourself and then someone else with us. In other words, even when I give someone advice, I'm actually giving myself advice along with them. I'm not talking down to them and saying this is what you need to hear. I have to acknowledge deep inside my heart and not let shaitan get between myself and my, my own heart, you know, and, and think that this advice is something they need to hear, not myself. This is shaitan coming to us even inside the masjid. Sometimes you guys will listen to me give a khutbah or somebody else give a khutbah and you're thinking in your head, man, I know someone who really needs to hear this. Man, I wish they were here. I'm gonna, is this online? Is this online? Because I need to share it with a friend who has this problem. You know, and you're, you're concerned with guiding someone else. And this entire time, you're not thinking about how this applies to you, or I'm not thinking about how this applies to me. We're thinking about how this applies to someone else. And that's a really powerful trick of shaitan. In your head, you're doing something good. You're actually sharing something good. You want better for someone else. And in, in your mind, this is actually a good, a positive thing. But it's not a positive thing it's if it's at the expense of a concern you have for yourself. This is why Allah told us, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ Nara, Save yourselves and your families from the fire. This is why even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, أُوْسِيكُمْ وَنَفْسِي بِتَقْوَ اللَّهِ Even the Messenger is saying, I'm counseling you and myself to be cautious of Allah. I'm including myself in that caution. Even Allah describes those who call others to Allah. Who could be better in speech than the one who invites other people to Allah? وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And acts good himself. You see the very immediate words, you're calling others to Allah, that's about them. While they're calling others to Allah, they are acting good themselves. And then they declare, إِنَّنِي وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ I am absolutely from among the Muslims, I'm not above them. I'm not above the people I'm calling, and I'm not above others. I'm trying to submit myself like everybody else. Just because I'm the one speaking and you're the one listening doesn't put me in a better position. But this is the kind of thing shaitan wants. He wants us to think that we're in a position now to give advice, not, we're not the ones to listen to it. And when shaitan really gets in somebody's head this way, somebody who gets used to giving religious advice, somebody who gets used to quoting ayat to somebody, or a hadith to somebody, or giving talks, or giving reminders, it doesn't have to be with a microphone on, it doesn't have to be on Facebook, it doesn't have to be on YouTube, it could be in a living room somewhere, people are getting together and having halaqat, or there's some member of your family that's always giving advice. When they get to a point where if you try to give them advice, they get really offended, that's a problem. Because now they've accepted in their head, their job is to give, never to receive. Their job is never to be criticized. Their job is, to, they're the ones to tell you how to have guidance. And then they have this attitude like, oh, you're going to tell me? You're going to correct me? How much do you know? I've been teaching for so long and you're going to correct me? This, this kind of attitude is directly from shaitan. It's directly from shaitan. So now coming again, this is again from the right. And by the way, this, the common theme of the shaitan's attacks from the right is the people who make these mistakes and fall into the trap of shaitan are convinced they're doing something good. They actually think they're doing something good. And Allah describes this in the Qur'an in a phrase, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Shaitan beautified their deeds to them. What they're doing, even if there's something wrong with it, it looks really good to them. And it's not just about evil deeds, even about good deeds. It starts, you start decorating it to yourself like you've accomplished something incredible. Then from the right, you know, notions like justice, care, concern, these are good, these are good qualities to have. 
And so sometimes people say, well, I'm fighting for justice. I'm fighting for the truth. These are good things. Nobody's going to say fighting for the truth is a bad thing. Nobody's going to say fighting for justice is a good thing. Nobody's going to say speaking out against evil is a bad thing. But people use these good words like justice, like truth, like fighting against evil, like amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, commanding the good and forbidding the evil, and use that to hurt others, and use that to destroy others, and use that to fulfill their own personal rage, and take, take vendettas and, you know, against people, and to commit all kinds of things. And when questioned, they say, no, no, I'm just speaking the haq, I'm just speaking for the truth. I'm standing by justice. I'm just forbidding an evil. And so you can use the right labels. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, for example, when the unjustified war happened in Iraq and the title was Operation Iraqi Freedom, right? It had nothing to do with freedom. But you can use beautiful words. You can use words that sound right. They sound justified and do all kinds of crimes underneath, you know? People, you know, in, in, in corrupt governments, you have people saying, well, we're taking care of our national security. They'll use national security. That's a good thing to say, national security. And under its guise, they're arresting innocent citizens, they're detaining people, torturing people, committing all kinds of heinous crimes. And, but when you say, what are you doing? They're not going to say we're committing acts against humanity. They're not going to say we're violating basic human rights. They're going to say, what? National security. That sounds like a good thing. The same thing happens in our personal lives. People being insulting, degrading, humiliating. And when you question them, they say, I have the right. What do you mean? I'm trying to correct this person. And, even, and forget about governments and high level, even within our families or personal situations, somebody may be, a family member may be insulting another family member, humiliating them, degrading them, putting them down, using all kinds of bad words. And you say, what are you doing? They say, I'm teaching them humility. I'm teaching them. I'm doing a good thing. I'm doing them a favor. I'm, I'm fixing them. They need to hear this. So they tell themselves they're actually doing something good even when they're engaged in something heinous and, and, and hideous. And that's how shaitan sometimes gets us. He feeds us that what we're doing is actually a good thing. And the way he does that is pretty amazing. One, he makes you feel like you haven't done anything wrong. You're completely justified in what you're doing. And two, the one you're doing it to, he makes them look like the source of all evil. They have no good in them. They must be destroyed. If the haqq of Allah is, supposed, is to be established, they must be annihilated. And so long as they're still around, or there's still a smile on their face, or they're still doing okay, then the truth hasn't come out yet. <laughs> you know? So you have, to, you have to keep going. You have to keep going. This is shaitan's trickery to people. And again, in their minds, they're doing something really, really good. One of the scariest tactics of shaitan from the right is, you know, Allah gave us the most power, you know, words are very powerful. Let's, let's take a minute or two to, compliment, to contemplate the power of words. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't give words like He gave human beings to animals. Animals communicate too. Ants communicate too. Birds communicate too. Fish communicate too. But the way human beings communicate is incredible. It's profound. You know, ten generations ago, the birds that were there built a nest, but they didn't teach their next generation, this is how you build a nest and this is how you're going to improve. They don't do that. They still build the same kind of nest. But human beings, when they built a home a thousand years ago, the next generation said, they built it this way, let's make this improvement. And the next generation came and made another improvement. And the next generation came and made another improvement. In other words, they leave instructions behind with words. And we take those words and we build on them, and build on them, and build on them. Without words, knowledge wouldn't go forward. Words are an incredible thing. It's a very powerful thing. And the most powerful of all words are the words of Allah. Is the guidance of Allah. How powerful it is. And yet, you know what can happen with the guidance of Allah? Which is of course a good, there's nothing better than the word of Allah. People can even use the word of Allah for evil purposes. Even the word of Allah can be used for evil purposes. Allah describes in the Qur'an, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِ بِهِ كَثِيرًا He misguides by using Qur'an so many, He allows so many to be misguided by using the Qur'an. And you and I are thinking, when Allah started Surah Al-Baqarah, in the very beginning He said, this book is guidance. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And now later on, not two, three pages go by, and Allah says the same Qur'an can be used to misguide. 
The same book that Allah sent for guidance, He's saying it can be used to misguide. Why? When shaitan comes to you and says, here's how you can convince people. You can take this ayah from here, that quote from there, this phrase from here, pull them all out of context, present them, and the person listening to you will say, they're talking about the word of Allah. They quoted this ayah and this ayah and this ayah and this ayah. It sounds pretty good. They're saying something good and they're actually saying something evil. Because their, their intention was not to explain the word of Allah. Their intention was to get their point across. And their, their agenda was above even the word of Allah. Let me explain this to you in another way so you remember this, 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 no, this trick of shaitan and how people use it. You know, when you, when, when, for example, somebody does research, first they gather the information. Then they study the information. They analyze the information. And after doing all of the research and all of the study, then they come to a conclusion. Right? So the conclusion is the last thing that comes. Not the first thing. That's the last thing. First you have to learn and analyze and research and then you get to the conclusion. But in some people's heads, they already have a conclusion. That's not the last thing. That is the first thing. And they say, I already have a conclusion. For example, I've met people who have a conclusion that women are inferior in Islam. I completely disagree. But in their head, there's this conclusion, women are inferior in Islam. Now that they have this conclusion, they will pick parts of ayat from here, parts of a hadith from here, parts of text from here, parts of text from there, and say, see, I have so much dalil, I have so much evidence that women are inferior. Instead of looking at all of the text, and all of the guidance of Allah, and then saying, I will have no conclusion first. I will let Allah speak without me putting my conclusion on top. I will let the conclusion come from Allah. I will let the conclusion come from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, 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 my conclusion's already there. And when you go to people, I've met people like that, and when they quote these things, I say, what about this ayah? What about this hadith? What about the wrong way you quoted this ayah? They say, no, 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 there's another way of looking at it. Not willing to look at, maybe I got this wrong, because my conclusion can't change. I can change the way to interpret the word of Allah, but my conclusion is set. This is satanic. This is evil. Because Allah's word, nothing is above it. Kalimatullahi wa kalimatullahi hi al-ulya. The word of Allah is in the highest place. Nothing is higher than the word of Allah. And people will do that, and actually it'll sound Islamic, because they're quoting all these Islamic texts. You know, it'll sound like they're speaking on behalf of religion. And that in and of itself is a kind of evil. When we don't represent the teachings of our deen, we actually represent conclusions that we're, we're in love with. We're in love with these conclusions, but not actually what Allah Himself says. Another way that people use the text is, again, you don't have to be ulama or khatibs or speakers or du'at or whatever to misuse. You can be in your families and, you know, people have an argument and the, the, the father has an argument with the son and he says, you know, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا You have to be the best to your parents. Or they quote, the, it's the only Qur'an he knows, by the way. You know, no other Qur'an. But whenever his son gets out of line, you know this is what Allah says. Or you know what Allah says about when you, when you don't give the rights to parents? When you do this? Or the, the husband quotes to the wife how she's going to burn in hell because a wife who does this, this, this is going to burn in hell. Or the, the wife quotes to the husband how he's not a real man and here's the ayah about it. You know? And they, they use their religion, they use the good that Allah gave to us, they use it to win arguments. They use it to slap each other. They, they use it as a weapon. Allah's words did not come for your personal arguments. Allah's words did not come so you can make someone shut up in your home. That's not why they came. Allah's words came, مَوْعِظَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ They came as a counsel that touches the heart from your Rabb. They didn't come to insult. They didn't come to humiliate. They didn't come to suppress. They didn't come to degrade. And when people misuse the word of Allah and they say, what did I do? I just quoted Qur'an. I'm just talking about Islam. My children, my wife doesn't want to listen. I even told her the word of Allah and she doesn't listen. No, you didn't tell her the word of Allah. You masked your ego and your own pride and your own anger with the word of Allah. You misrepresented the word of Allah if you did that. The same thing a parent can do, a mother can do to her daughter. A sibling can do to a sibling, you know. This is, and in their head, again, they're quoting Islam. This is not why you learn Islam. That's not why you, how you, you quote Allah's word. 
You have to be very careful not to do that. And that's again a trick of shaitan, making us think we're actually extracting guidance while all we're doing is pushing people away from Allah's guidance. Because those people, when they hear the word of Allah being used to humiliate them, in their head, the word of Allah causes humiliation. Why would they come closer to the word of Allah? We became a reason. So many families that are, they look religious, they act religious, they are knowledgeable religiously, and their children are running away from the religion because they misuse the word of Allah in the home. They misused it in the home. They used it to yell and insult and humiliate their kids. And their kids feel like their dignity is taken away because of Islam. And it's not those kids' fault. Our frustration is one thing. Our submission to Allah and our humility to Allah's guidance is something else. You want to yell at your kids? Be my guest, if there's a context for it. You want to be upset? There's a way to communicate that. But don't use the deen for it. Don't use the deen. That's, that's not your, it's not yours. You don't own it. You don't get to use it the way you want. You have to submit ourselves. You know, and people feel when they're in a position of authority, they can use the, the word of Allah to, to reinforce their authority. The word of Allah did not come to establish your authority. The word of Allah did not come to establish your place. Or to put somebody else in their place. That's not why it came. This is not how we should use it. And that's again what shaitan wants. And he does that, and everybody who does it is thinking again, I did something good, I, I'm citing the word of Allah. I should get reward for this. <laughs> he comes from the right. You see how, how, tricker, how this trickery work, works. But again, and again, there are other attacks from the right. I'll mention just a couple more before I close. And one, one of them is, you know, I'll give you by an example first. You know, if you get a job, and your job is, let's say, you have five things to do every day. And your boss tells you, Task number one is the most important. This is the one that's the most important. If you finish this task, and you're done with it, and you have some time left, then you can do number two. And if you have some extra time left, then you can do number three. But if it, you were working for eight hours, and you only worked on number one, that's okay. Because that's the most important. Until that is done, we don't care about anything else. So there are priorities. When your boss gives you priorities, you have to respect your boss's priorities. You get the same job, five items, the boss explains to you, this is the most important, then this, then this, then this, then this, then item number five. And all day you worked on item number five. And your boss comes in and says, is the job done? He goes, yep, I did the best number five you've ever seen in your life. Look at this. What's your boss going to do? Why didn't you do number one? Well, you know, I felt like I'm doing so good at number five that I really don't have to do number one. Because look at how good I did number five. You don't decide that. Your boss does. He's the one paying you. He's the one who hired you. He's the one who has the authority. I'm not telling you about a boss. I'm telling you about Allah. Allah tells you and me, here's the most important thing in Islam. Here's what you must do. Here are things you must stay away from. These are the fara'id. They're absolutely necessary for you. You must accomplish these. And these are the things, no matter what, you must stay away from them. We come along, and shaitan comes from the side and says, Hey, why don't you give a lot of charity? And since you give a lot of charity, you don't have to worry so much about the prayers. And when you don't worry about the prayers, and somebody says, or, or even the thought comes to you, Well, I don't pray. Well, yeah, I know I don't pray, but I give a lot of charity, you know. Yeah, charity has its place. But it doesn't substitute the priorities Allah set. I don't have the right to set those priorities. Allah sets those priorities. But in your head, you're, you did something good. You gave charity. You helped somebody. You did some task you really love doing. Some people, in their head, they say, I can do whatever I want, so long as I do really good in Ramadan. That's item number five for them, right? If I just do really good in Ramadan, then I have 11 month vacation from everything Allah asks me. I can do that, it's fine. In some people's heads, they pray. They pray. They, 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 they eat zabiha meat. They make sure every time they go to a store, where did you get this animal from? Let me see the, pic, the video of this animal being slaughtered. Was this Allahu Akbar said through a tape record, a video recorder, MP3 file, a YouTube video? Or did a guy actually say it? I want proof before I eat this barbecue chicken. They are so set on eating halal. And yet, at the same time, same guy hasn't given mahar to his wife. Same guy has denied inheritance to his sister. Same guy cheating other people in business, not paying their money back. Lying. Same person. Because in their head, this is important. This is my Islam. This is Allah is going to be really happy about this chicken. 
But it's all this other stuff, that's okay. This will cover it. This will cover it. People have this thought about Hajj. If I just go to Hajj, clean slate, so I'm good. You know? So shaitan comes and says, these things that you like doing, why don't you focus on those? And there are other things in Islam that maybe they're a little bit more effort for you. They're hard for you. Allah will understand. You just do what you're comfortable with. Okay, you just do that and be happy with that. And you tell, you tell yourself you're doing something great. The final trick of shaitan I want to share with you is when you start defining for yourself what does it mean to be good? What does it mean? There's one thing that there were five tasks and you pick number five. But it's another entirely when you come in and say, no, forget these five tasks. I'll tell you what's important. I have my own list of five. I feel I should be doing this. This is what Allah makes, me, makes Allah happy. Because now your own feelings and your own impressions and your own opinions are above what Allah revealed. But in your head, this is because you're a good human being, you have a good heart, and you have good intention. So long as you mean well, that's all Allah wants. You, have, you, you maybe heard someone say, you know, I know Allah says this, 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 and this. He wants me to do this, He wants me to do that. But you know, I'm actually a good person. I'm actually a pretty good person. I'm nice to people, I'm honest at work, I'm courteous, etc., etc. So, you know, those things, I know people that pray and people, women that wear hijab or people that have beards, they're really messed up. So at least I'm not like them. I have my own way of being good. And that's okay, Allah will understand. And that's what shaitan comes and tells you. It's okay, you don't have to submit yourself to Allah's revelation because there are bad examples out there. So all you have to do is tell yourself Allah will understand and you can come up with your own lifestyle. And consider yourself good. Just tell yourself you're great, you know. In all of these, these attacks from the right, again, the common thread is what? You tell yourself it's okay. You tell yourself you're doing something good. I tell myself this is fine. I, one last came, one, came to mind, and since inshallah ta'ala, next time I'll be talking about the left, I'll finish it up, and it, this, should, this should take no more than one minute. And that is that people, you know, Allah says, there are people who when they want to find Islam, they want to find guidance, right? They find it with a, they go to a masjid, they meet some people, and they, they be, become closer to Allah because they met those people, right? But you guys know that Muslims are not all the same. Masjids are not all the same, right? So when you go to one masjid and you meet a group of people, they maybe belong to a school of thought, or they have certain scholars that they respect, or they follow a certain curriculum, right? And you, you go there and you're really happy with these people because you found Allah through those people. But then you go to a different masjid and you find those people are not like these people. These people have much shorter beards. These people aren't even covering their head. Like this deviant over here, they're not even covering their head. And those people over there, the way they hold their hands when they pray is different from the way I hold my hands. And so you start telling yourself, the group I'm with, the one who brought me close to Allah, Alhamdulillah, I found the right one. I feel bad for all these other people. And so what becomes your righteous cause? What becomes your good deed? Warning everybody about everybody else who's going to hell so they can join your club. Because everybody else is misguided. Everybody else is far from Allah. They're wrong because of this. They're wrong because of this. They're wrong because of this. Let me tell you why we're the best ones. Actually, let me not tell you why we're amazing. Let me just focus my time on telling you why they're terrible. Because we have to make sure people are guided. You started off with something good. You met people that brought you closer to Allah. But when that turns into a cult, and when that turns into, when you see a Muslim, first you see which kind of Muslim, They'll tell me which, so uh, what are you? And he says Muslim, yeah, yeah, I know Muslim, but uh, you know, <laughs> you need to, that's not enough. When that starts happening, that's from the devil, that's from shaitan. Because we don't want, in, it's not enough that somebody is, accepts Allah as their master. It's not enough for you that Muhammad is their messenger sallallahu alayhi wa It's not enough. I need to make sure that you have a membership in the same club that I do. And if you don't, then we have a problem. And then I'm going to spend my time telling you how you need to fix yourself and come join my club. Otherwise I feel bad for you. When that happens, that is the height of self-righteousness. This goes back to the first thing I said. When people assume their own guidance. No group of Muslims owns guidance. No, no, no members of a masjid own guidance. No imam owns guidance. Nobody owns guidance. That is with Allah. Allah owns it. 
You can say if somebody is doing something wrong or saying something wrong, there's a humble way, a loving way to express that to them. Ibrahim salam's father was worshipping idols, making idols at home. And he had a loving way of correcting him. Look at how we correct other Muslims. Not even worshippers of idols. How do people in the name of truth give sermons about how these other people, some Muslims are wajibul qatil according to them. They should be murdered and executed. Or they are followers of shaitan and degrading and humiliating other Muslims because of what they believe. This is how you plan on correcting them? Which prophet ever did this? Which prophet ever spoke in this way? How did, how did prophets correct other people's, even if you think it's misguidance, this is the way to do it? This is the way to speak? So we, we find the most evil ways of what we think is doing something good. You know, doing good isn't just about what you do, it's also about how you do it. May Allah Azza wa protect us from the attacks of shaitan from the, from the right and keep us committed to the right path. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.